Welcome back to UEFA Champions League review right here on EFD. Me and Chris Hamill running down last night's biggest results. Tottenham 2, Barcelona 4 is the first one. What happened, Hans? It was an absolute demolition, yes. wasn't it? And we thoroughly enjoyed it. Watched it here, did a live stream. I hope you tuned in for it. Hope you enjoyed it. The pitch, though, absolutely shocking. A Blame surface AJ. not deserving of Messi's genius. Yes, thank you, Anthony Joshua. For that, I mean, statistically, this was 0.5 to 2.5 unexpected goals in Barcelona's favour. Yes. So a fairly convincing victory from the off. However, I feel like the scoreline ultimately was generous. If Luis Suarez had his shooting boots on, this could have been five or six two. It was easy for Barcelona in the end, despite some hairy moments. Now, talking of hairy moments, there was some hairy defending in this game from Tottenham. And what has happened since they've transitioned to a back four? It's been despicably bad. Hugo Lloris not helping out his defenders with the first goal, running out like a headless chicken. Joe, I know Seriously. You, you, you pretty much despise again, him at this point. Again, he makes a mistake that costs Tottenham. As soon as he flies out like a keeper on pro clubs, you know he's in trouble. And it was in 49 seconds into the game. Meep, meep. It's the fastest Champions League goal since 2005. As soon as that happens, their entire game plan goes out the window. Yeah, and Potts said as much, didn't he? Which we'll look at a little bit later. However, um, I will say that his defenders didn't help him out from there on in. No. Davison Sanchez probably at fault for the second. Trippier and Musa Sissoko combining in the worst possible way for the fourth. But let's take nothing away from the Messi masterclass against English opposition. It continues, doesn't it? He's now been involved in more goals versus English teams than any other non-Spanish nation with 22 goals and six assists. But it's can insane. he do it on a rainy Tuesday night against Stoke? Yes, definitely. They're terrible. Well, there we go. Put pay to that argument. On the night, he was quite frankly frightening. 96 touches, six shots, four on target, two onto the beans on toes, three chances created, two take-ons and two goals. Carol Vorderman I'm numbers. Out of breath. Carol Vorderman numbers. I'll have yes. two from the top. A consonant, please, Carol. What's M? Is that a consonant? Probably. For Messi. Anyway, a few of the note performances include Busquets. 100% pass accuracy, nine tackles and interceptions. So just Get doing... In the Doing what he does best. Get and in the bin. Yeah, you dirty dog. All right, Sergio, just controlling that midfield. And I thought he dovetail really nicely with Arthur, who I was pretty impressed with last night. Yeah. Great at finding space, <clears throat> actually ordering around season pros, which is always a good sign. He's got that good match intelligence. Jordi Alba, three assists for the little diminutive left back. And when Messi's on song, generally Alba is as well, because they combine extremely well down yes. the left-hand side. He was practically playing as a left winger. I think as soon as he saw Ben Davis, he was like, I'm having this. I'm yeah. having him. Made absolute Welsh rabbit out of him. Yeah, he got three assists. Like I said, a couple of those were Suarez shimmies. And if Suarez Beautiful was shooting as well. like he was shimmying, like, like I said, could have been much more convincing. Over to Poch now, who had some very choice words after the game. Bit, bit cheesed off, wasn't it? We cannot talk about topics. We need to talk about reality. And reality, with the handicap to play, Again, a team like Barcelona conceded after one minute on the game. I seen our player were uh, heroes playing again: uh, Messi, uh, Suarez, Coutinho, and company, and and were in the, on the game and be competitive on the second half. I think Lucas Moura, if he scored the third goal, we, sure do we talk about uh, that we are a hero. The manager is the best in the world, and what changed? Change nothing. To be fair to Spurs, when you've got an injury list that includes Jan Vertonghen, Dele Alli, Christian Eriksen, Moussa Dembele, Aurier, you are always going to struggle against Barcelona. So not an easy game, mm. but I continue my war against Pochettino's four at the back. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked at all this season. Davinson Sanchez is clearly not comfortable in there replacing Jan Vertonghen. I think last night he averaged 78% pass accuracy. Jan is usually up around the 90% mark alongside Toby Alderweireld. He works in a back three, Davinson Sanchez, as the athletic member, whilst Jan Vertonghen and Toby Alderweireld pass out from the back. Mm. He covers the wing backs really well. We saw it loads last season. When they push forward, he drops into that space and covers. But in a back two, he can't do it. The same thing happened against Liverpool when it was often three forwards bearing down on two central defenders. It happened again in this game where Kieran Trippier was way too high up the pitch and the ball was just getting played in behind to Jordi Alba by Lionel Messi. Not good enough. Kieran Trippier cannot play as a right back in a four. He needs to be a wing back. 
in that mm. situation. He's much better in an advanced position. Last night, no tackles, no interceptions, seven crosses, two accurate. Not really good enough. Ben Davis, the same on the other side. I just can't believe Danny Rose isn't being played as the left back in the system. Yeah, it's, a little bit more pace. It's really odd from Pochettino. Two crosses, no accurate, no dribbles, no tackles, no interceptions. Not good enough from Ugly Ben Davis reading. either. The back four is a horrible mess. Mm. And that kind of lack of confidence is spreading throughout the team because the two midfielders in front of him, Harry Winks and Victor Wanyama, not good enough for a team that's playing against Barcelona in the Champions League. It really isn't. Yeah, normally when Tottenham are finding it difficult to transition out of defence, Christian Eriksen will drop in and pick the ball up, won't he? However, last night, severely lacking, and struggling to get it out of the back. And when, and when you're having to bring on Eric Dyer and um, Moussa two, Sissoko, two the same player. Yep. It, it, it doesn't work. It really doesn't work. Since beating Manchester United at Old Trafford, they've played six, lost four, drawn one and won one. Obviously, that's in 90 minutes because the mm. one they drew, they did go on to win on penalties. But... The record is really poor at the moment for Tottenham Hotspur. They're on crap form. The defence is useless. The midfield's all over the place. Pochettino needs to tighten up his ship quickly. Some major surgery needed in January in that central midfield area. Maybe a bit of cover at fullback, although he does have Rose and Aurier, like you said, who's that? Injured. Vertonghen could apparently who be out for six weeks. Who was Skip on the bench weeks. last night? Skip, nobody knows who Skip Prawn is. Prawn and cocktail vibes. Unbelievable. But Vertonghen could be out for up to six weeks with a pulled or torn hamstring. Yeah. Which is really bad because unless they shift to a back three and drop Eric Dyer into the middle of it, which I'm not a big fan of either, they're in continuous trouble. Yes, continuous trouble. Not happy with how they've started the season. And on that bombshell, let's move on. Over to the Stadio San Paolo now where the little donkeys put Liverpool to the sword. What happened, mate? Yeah, I saw a lot of Liverpool fans on my Twitter saying this is actually the worst performance they've seen <gasps> in the Jurgen Klopp era. Pretty damning, that. Which is pretty crazy. Lorenzo Insigne getting an 89th minute winner. 1-0 this finished. Uh, on his 271st appearance for the club, he's now the ninth in the all-time Napoli appearance chart, which is pretty impressive, isn't it? Uh, despite the last minute nature of the win, they actually were pretty dominant. 14 shots not Napoli had, five on target. Liverpool didn't have a single shot on target on the night. That's really crazy. Their expected Rare. goal was 0.1, the lowest it's been all season. 0 0.1 well, for Liverpool. Burnley managed 0 0.2 the on the vibes. This is literally <laughs> Sean Deitch vibes. Uh, Napoli produced some really high quality chances too. Six coming from inside the penalty area and three from inside the six yard box. All of Liverpool's shots were from 18 yards or further. Not Ooh. good enough from Jurgen Klopp's men on the, on the night. And this really opens the group up because obviously they've won one, lost one, PSG won one, lost one and now Napoli are top on four points. It's an exciting group. Yeah, it really is. I'm looking forward to seeing how this group unfolds in particular. Now, I was watching the highlights back this morning and the first half seemed quite attritional. Low quality from both sides. And I know Naby Keita had to go off after 20 or so minutes due to a back spasm. He's back at the weekend, so no fears there. But I think that made a big difference because in the second half, Napoli's midfield three or four, they kind of lined up in a 4-4-2, really made the difference. Alan, his physicality really came to the fore. Five tackles, three blocks, a pass actually of 95% as well. And he dovetailed really nicely with uh, Hamzik, who was really stitching together the midfield and attack. 97 passes on the night, 27 more than the closest Liverpool That's player. Crazy. Now, for Liverpool, there were a couple of redeemable performances, such as Joe Gomez. He was Liverpool's uh, most proficient passer, let's say, and I thought he was pretty composed at the back, unfortunate to be on the losing side. And Andy Robertson, who made six tackles, highest on the pitch, by the by. However, Mo Salah's poor form continues, and he was pretty inept in this game. The Egyptians' 90 looked like this. Two shots, none on target, zero chances created, zero dribbles with a pass accuracy of 75 percent and his season prior to this game wasn't too different to his start last year yeah so not a famously quick starter let's say so there's definitely more to come but he does look a little bit out of sorts doesn't he i think he'll be okay he's yeah. just growing into it and the thing is is liverpool were always going to share the goals amongst that forward line more evenly yeah. this season he was never going to hit 45 again this season and this game aside he's still taking 4.3 shots per 90 so the chances Crazy. are still coming in yeah. you tend to to get worried when a strike is not generating any clear-cut opportunities, yeah. which is not the case with Mo Salah. Anyway, uh, difficult for him to score when 
uh, Napoli's second choice left back, Mario Rui, is creating more chances than the entire Liverpool side. Up next for Napoli is PSG away and Red Star are Liverpool's next opponents at home. Two good games, like I said. That group is tasty. Mm. Moving on to another tasty fixture, it's Dortmund. The final game we're looking at, Borussia Dortmund 3, Monaco nil. Yeah, Monaco's terrible start to the season continues. BVB absolutely battered him in this game 3-0 thanks to goals from Jacob Brun Larsen, Paco Alcalfa and Marco Royce. Now, Alcalfa also missed a penalty as Dortmund absolutely ripped through Monaco's bat line again and again with expected goals having this game at 3.2 to 0.7. So pretty much bang on as was the case with the other games. Now, Jadon Sancho grabbed another assist in this game. Jadon Sancho, better than Pulisic in my opinion. The best prospect that Manchester City have produced in the last five years, better than Diaz, arguably better than Foden. Oh, maybe a bit of a hot take. Anyway, Foden hasn't done anything. Jadon Sancho continues to impress. But we move on. This means that since the start of 2018, amongst Bundesliga players, only Bayern Munich's Thomas Muller with 13 has provided more assists in all competitions. Jadon Sancho has more assists than he has starts. Absolutely frightening. But Larson and Royce were the stars in this game. The 20-year-old Dane came on at half-time, scored five minutes later and set up Royce's 91st minute strike to boot. Now, this brings Larson, who actually joined Dortmund's academy in 2015, to three goals and two assists in just 267 minutes across the league and Champions League so far this season. So they've got quite a few uh, economic young stars, let's say. Meanwhile, Royce took four shots, created four chances, completed three dribbles and completed four interceptions to a typically well-rounded performance from the captain coming in top in all four categories. Now, he's been involved in 14 goals in just 10 home appearances in the Champions League, so he absolutely loves it at the Wesch Fallon Stadion, doesn't he? Nine goals, five assists, Joe. Yeah, and you talked a little bit about their young players there. They're just in, as impressive at the back as well. Zagadou, Diallo, Akanji uh, all playing yesterday, 19, 22, 23 years old respectively. In fact, eight of the 14 players Borussia Dortmund used in this match are under the age of 24. Four. And in the Bundesliga, 10 of their 18 goals, not including own goals in this, have been scored by under 23 year olds, which is just ridiculous. They just continue that production line of young, exciting talent. Uh, this is actually only the first time they've won back to back Champions League since November 2016. Back to back Champions League games, sorry, say, uh, which yeah. is not great. It's impressive. Uh, match day two. Monaco, also awful form, winless yeah. in nine now which is not a good sign for Leo Jardim. Maybe he's finally coming to the end of the cycle. There's only so many times you can turn a team over selling players. We saw Klopp at Borussia Dortmund have the same struggles, Thomas Tuchel have the same struggles, and now Leo Jardim seems to be having the same struggles at Monaco. You just can't keep selling your best talent no. and expecting to do well. Uh, they've also gone 10 Champions League games now without a win, drawing two and losing <sighs> eight. It's not great news for Monaco, but Borussia Dortmund flying at the moment, doing really well. Yeah. With a young team, it's exciting. Well, it's about time someone challenged Bayern at the top of the pecking order in German football, isn't it? I think they actually knocked them off top. They did. Recently. They exciting did. times, the Bundesliga is finally back, baby. Guys, who do you think is going to win German's top division? And will Dortmund top this group? Let us know in the comments below. So that's it for UA for Champions League Review for another week. Hamill, what else is happening on the channel? Well, we have Stat Wars The League, of course, twice a week. I can't remember who is coming this Saturday, but I know it's going to be a bloody good one. And Football Social, two this weekend, baby. Man. Tottenham versus Cardiff on Saturday, so tune in for that. And the big one on Sunday where we're going to be joined by a Liverpool and Manchester City legend. Two legends, that is, for the two very clever. One of them, Sean Gota. Feed the goat. I don't know what that is.